thank you JCC Manhattan and uh, thank you everybody for being up at this <laughs> wonderful hour uh, <laughs> and learning with me. I'm incredibly humbled and honored and impressed that there are so many folks here right now. So thank you um, wherever you're joining from the comfort of your sofa, your bed, kitchen, wherever you are. Uh, I'm going to start sharing my screen and we will get started. Okay. Uh, a thumbs up if everybody sees my screen. Yes, everything is good. Great, thank you. And if uh, if my voice cuts out or anything, uh, Rachel, please interrupt and and tell me so that I'm not going on and on thinking everybody's understanding me and hearing me. <laughs> will do. Is. Wonderful. And also, friends, um, as I will be going along, um, I'm much more comfortable with having people interrupt me in the middle, ask me questions. Um, however, we do have a good number of people here, and we only have about 50 minutes together. Um, and so because of that, um, I will encourage folks, like Rachel said, to um, ask questions in the, in the chat box. And then every couple of minutes or so, I will stop and, um, and then maybe Rachel, you can um, uh, read aloud some of the questions or synthesize if there, if there are several questions on the same theme. So I'll try to do that as much as possible, but I also have a lot of uh, great content to, to get through. And if we don't get through all of it, that's no problem as well. I always put more <laughs> content that we can uh, get through. Um, but uh, this is a, a, a final, uh, a, a last minute call. If you're not here to learn about the crossroads of Sephardic, Mizrahi, and LGBTQ plus identities, um, then uh, feel free to, to leave and, and, and go somewhere else. But that's what we're gonna be talking about today. And first, we have a, a little activity here. Now, usually I would add, call upon people to, to read the slides I'm about to show you, but um, again, it'll be a little bit more difficult with such a big group, so I'll, I'll do it for us. And we're just gonna dive in and then uh, kind of um, debrief what this was all about. The ancient El Ghriba Synagogue is located on the Tunisian island of Jerba. According to local Jewish tradition, it's believed that after the destruction of the first temple, a group of priests fled to Jerba, bringing with them a door and a stone from the Beit HaMikdash, which contributed to the construction of the synagogue. <clears throat> and it has become the destination of an annual pilgrimage of thousands of Tunisian Jews on the holiday of Lag Omer. I wanna, I wanna actually move this bar away. Okay, good. The Cairo Geniza is a collection of about 400,000 Jewish manuscript frag fragments that were found in a storeroom of the Ben Ezra Synagogue in Fustat, in Old Cairo. Written in Hebrew, Arabic, Aramaic, Greek, Ladino, and other languages, these documents span a thousand years of Jewish, Mediterranean, African, and Asian history. And they comprise the largest collection of medieval manuscripts in the world. Moving on to Syria, the Aleppo Codex, the world's oldest former, uh, there's a reason for that because there were some things that happened in the second half of the 20th century, but at one point it was the oldest former complete copy of the Hebrew Bible was stored for centuries <clears throat> in Aleppo Central Synagogue, which had been a place of worship since the fifth century common era. In the early 1900s, Syrian Jews started immigrating to the Americas en masse, and the largest Syrian Jewish community currently is located in Brooklyn. With a population of 75,000, other large Syrian communities are found in Israel and throughout Latin America. During a traditional Yemenite Jewish wedding, the bride is bedecked with jewelry and wears a tashbuk, an elaborate cone-shaped headdress decorated with flowers and pearls. The wedding is prefaced by a henna ceremony in which dice placed onto the skin of the bride and her guests. The history of the Jews of Yemen in the Arabian Peninsula is over 2,600 years old, but with only a handful estimated to still be remaining in Yemen, the majority of Temanim, of Yemenite Jews, currently live in Israel. 
now to Iraq. The tomb of the biblical prophet Yehezkel, Ezekiel, is located in Kifil, Iraq. It had long been an important place of worship for Iraq's ancient Jewish community. Jews have lived in Iraq ever since the Babylonian captivity in 586 BCE, producing important religious works like the Babylonian Talmud. And while most of Iraq's Jews spoke and wrote in Judeo-Arabic, the Kurdish Jews of the north spoke Aramaic. By the 1930s, Jews made up a third of Baghdad's population alone. Baghdad's population alone was over one third Jewish. But between 48 and 1951, nearly all the Jews of Iraq had escaped. Back to North Africa. Jews have lived in Libya for over 2,000 years under Greek, Roman, Ottoman, Italian, and British rule. Waves of anti-Jewish violence in the second half of the 20th century led to the mass migration of Libyan Jews. And there are no Libyan Jews uh, uh, currently in, in the country. In 2011, a Libyan Jew from Italy tried to restore the main synagogue of Tripoli, but was ultimately barred from doing so. There was actually a story, a piece about, uh, about him in time several years ago, and this was the, the gentleman. And what we see here, the ruins of, of the synagogue are this, are the synagogue we see on the left in its, in its heyday. The majority of France's Jewish population is of North African descent, mainly from Algeria. As was the case in other parts of North Africa, Jews first arrived in Algeria over 2,000 years ago and settled among the Amazir people, also um, known as the, the Berber people. After thriving for centuries in Islamic Iberia, Al-Andalus, modern-day Spain and Portugal, the Jews of Sepharad were expelled by the Catholic rulers in the 15th century, and many settled in the lands of their co-religionists in North Africa. While Algeria had 140,000 Jews in the 50s, none remain in the country. So similar to Libya, none are there anymore. Most synagogues were destroyed or converted to mosques, including these two grand synagogues we see in Algier and Oran that are now um, uh, uh, places of um, uh, worship um, for, for Muslims, their mosques. Spanish and Portuguese Jews, also known as Western Sfaradim, descend from the Converso, the crypto Jews, who continued living in the Iberian Peninsula following the mass expulsion of Jews from the region in the 14, 1490s. Fleeing continued persecution, they ultimately migrated to parts of Western Europe, notably Amsterdam and London, as well as across the Atlantic in the 17th and 18th centuries founding the oldest congregations in the Americas, in places such as Rhode Island, New York City. This is uh, the um, um, <clears throat> Sherith Israel Synagogue in New York City, which is the oldest congregation in the US. The building isn't the oldest, but the congregation is. And also uh, they founded congregations in uh, cities like Curaçao. Bukharian Jews constitute the native Jewish population of Central Asia. The community has a rich musical and dance tradition that developed against the cultural backdrop of its musical neighbors, of its Muslim neighbors, sorry. The community's native language, Bukhari, is a Judeo-Persian dialect. And uh, in addition to that, most Bukharian Jews also speak Russian because we have lived under Tsarist and then Soviet rule. The Azerbaijani village of Kirmizek Kasaba is believed to be the world's only all Jewish town outside of Israel or the USA. Of Iranian Jewish origin, Kafkazi mountain Jews have inhabited the Eastern and Northern Caucasus for nearly 2000 years. Of the roughly 250,000 Kafkazi Jews, 10,000 still live in Azerbaijan, which is a Shia majority, a Shia Muslim majority country uh, that has strong relations with Israel. Greece, now we're in the Balkans, has long been the home of two distinct Jewish communities, the Romanio Jews, who actually comprise the oldest Jewish community of Europe, having lived in Europe since Hellenistic times. And then the, the later Ladino speaking Sephardic Jewish community with origins in the Iberian Peninsula. Cities like Salonika were central hubs of Sephardic life for almost 500 years until the Nazi occupation, which resulted in the near extermination of Greece's Jews. Uh, proportionally, uh, more Jews had perished <clears throat> during the Holocaust in Greece than in any other European country in proportion to the total Jewish population of the countries. 
Mimuna is a post-Pesach Pesach Moroccan Jewish celebration, serving as the official return to Hametz and symbolizing good fortune. In the 40s, some 300,000 Arabic, Amazigh, French, and Spanish-speaking Jews lived throughout Morocco, the largest Jewish population in a Muslim-majority country. About 3,000 Jews still remain there, and roughly 1 million Jews of Moroccan descent currently reside in Israel. Morocco still has, uh, even though it's a much smaller population, uh, the largest population of Jews in an Arab country. Oh, I had another <laughs> slide about Morocco. Well, for, for the sake of time, we will, we will move on to the next one. Sigd is a holiday unique to the Ethiopian Jewish community, the Beta Israel. Sigd celebrates the Jewish people's return to the land of Israel and their rededication to the Torah after the Babylonian exile. In Israel today, Sigd is considered a national holiday. And during that holiday, the Kassim, the elders of the community, gather the community in Jerusalem, carrying Torah scrolls and reciting excerpts from it in the classical Ethiopian language, Ge'ez. In South Asia, there are several distinct Jewish communities, including the millennia-old Cochin and Bene Israel Jews, as well as the centuries-old Spanish, Portuguese, and Baghdadi communities. Within the latter community, the Baghdadi community, prominent tycoons emerged in the 1800s. Among them was the Sassoon family, that funded the construction of many beautiful synagogues, including uh, the one we see here, and major uh, public buildings like libraries in India. The tomb of Esther and Mordechai is located in Hamadan, Iran. It's the most important pilgrimage site for the roughly 10 to 15,000 Jews still residing in the country. Jews have lived in Iran since biblical times for over 2,500 years. Among the cultural contributions of Iranian Jews is the development of a rich Judeo-Persian literary tradition that combined classical Persian poetic forms and styles with themes from the Torah. Under Ottoman rule, Eastern European Balkan cities, such as Sofia in <clears throat> Bulgaria and Sarajevo, became vibrant centers for Jews escaping uh, Spanish expulsion and persecution. Other parts of the Ottoman Empire, oh, and the synagogue on the left is the Grand Synagogue, Sephardic Synagogue in Bulgaria. Other parts of the Ottoman Empire, like the Turkish cities of Istanbul and Izmir, also experienced a flourishing of Sephardic Ladino culture. Istanbul's community still has 16 active synagogues, this is one of them, Neve Shalom. It's a more uh, recently built synagogue and is legally represented by the Hacham Bashi, uh, the country's chief rabbi. Okay, so again, usually I do this weird. I ask different folks to read the slides so you're not hearing so much of my, of my voice, um, but it's still important for me to ground our discussion, our conversation in what I just showed. And so the question that I'd like to ask is, why am I showing these slides? And I <laughs> so naturally would like people to respond, but again, I have to remember <laughs> the kind of format we're in, but think a little bit about it. And um, I will now offer to you my reason for showing this. The reason why I begin my conversation about um, uh, this topic, the intersection of Sephardic Mizrak and LGBT uh, identity, um, and other uh, topics that I, that I speak about regarding Sephardic and Mizrahi visibility in general. The reason I begin with these slides, and by the way, my voice, everybody can still hear, thumbs up. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Is because a lot of what I have just presented for many people in my own experiences, and I've been doing community building work for quite a while, uh, maybe it's different with the uh, uh, with the group we have here, but a lot of what I've ex what I've presented, if not all of it, is very foreign to many folks, to uh, to many Jewish part uh, audience members, to uh, to people in a room when I'm talking about Sephardic and Mizrahi histories, and if it is not completely foreign, it is often seen as exotic, or something surprisingly different. And 
I think that shows the fact that there are certain stories and certain narratives that do not gain, uh, up to, uh, gain or get the same platform as others in Jewish discourse, in American Jewish discourse, in academia, in um, K through 12 education, in community centers, in different schools. There are certain stories that are seen as kind of, dare I say, the other or um, less commonly told. And ultimately, that does a disservice to all of us. It's not only a shame because of what it says about um, some of the phenomena of what, you know, of, of what stories get more attention. Um, it's not only a shame because it might um, minimize certain parts of uh, uh, the histories of certain Jewish communities, but it's also a shame because it deprives all of us of the beautiful diversity of the Jewish people. And so I begin with this, not as a way to check off the Sephardic Mizrahi boxes and say, hey, look, we covered all these fun facts, now we know. No, I really want to be very clear about this. What uh, my intention is for us to then begin a conversation about global Jewish diversity and also about what narratives are sometimes more commonplace and which ones are not and what is lost when there is that disparity. And so I hope before we move on that um, if anything that I said from the previous slides, if it was interesting, if it was new, and again, I'm not assuming there might be folks here who um, knew a lot of this stuff, which is wonderful. But if there are things here that were new, I encourage you to then uh, do more research. And so these slides were really just the tip of the iceberg of the complex and beautiful histories and cultures of Sephardic and Mizrahi Jews. And by no means was it a way for me to essentialize them and say, we covered it all. I also chose certain communities and left others out. And I, I, I made that choice. And so I want us now to zoom in a little bit more. I know I have a lot of uh, uh, text here, um, but I want us to zoom in a little bit more on the phenomenon that um, has caused, might have caused certain stories and certain narratives to be um, placed more on the margins. And there's this term that has come about um, in recent years um, in, uh, I would say, actually less in academic discourse and more in um, the community, community building space and, and, and grassroots community um, building environments. Um, but, and also in, I would just say, Jewish community leadership in general. And that term is Ashkenormativity. It's this term that maybe some have heard. It's kind of a, a little bit of a, of a jargony term. Um, it's a play on uh, a term that is uh, more known, which is heteronormativity, um, or another one is cisnormativity. Uh, so for example, heteronormativity, uh, it basically uh, alludes to the phenomenon where um, the assumption that is made about a person is that they are straight. Right, that that is the default. And so kind of using that same model, Ashkenormativity normativity is a term that has emerged to talk about um, what, is, what has happened a lot in American, in the American uh, Jewish context, which is that the default assumption of what is Jewish is the Ashkenazi experience. And I want us to look at a few sources here that, um, talk about this phenomenon. And I want you to think about if you find this compelling or if this is um, uh, troubling to you and, or you know, if you're pushing back against it. Um, so I want us to look at some of these sources and then I'll come back to why um, it's also important for me to, to talk about this phenomenon, this uh, kind of a, a systemic, um, I guess, uh, yeah, phenomenon in, in the Jewish community. And so um, the first source is from a, a historian who doesn't use the word Ashkenormative, but very much talks about what we are uh, discussing here. And he says, Matthias, 
uh, Lehman says, Sephardic Jewelry still, all, still appears all too often as a monolithic other, a token of diversity, or simply a catch-all for all things non-Ashkenazi. That is non-normative Judaism, non-normative Jewish history and culture. Yet in reality, Sephardic identity was always diverse and varied with context, right? So this scholar is talking about how um, it has still, uh, to this day, often been seen as kind of a, a, this monolithic other. Um, another uh, uh, person who actually was one of the first to start using the term Ashkenazi normativity um, wrote an article in the foreword uh, where they defined really kind of what, what this process is. Ashkenazi normativity is a systemic, communal, and or individual assertion of Ashkenazi as the default Jewish identity and the assumptions we make based on that assertion and the resulting marginalization of non-Ashkenazi Jews, right? So it is assuming that a default Jewish identity is Ashkenazi, but then the effect of that, which is the marginalization of voices and stories that do not fall into that category. <clears throat> another uh, good working definition uh, comes from um, another article, uh, <clears throat> Which, um, which says in source three, Ashkenazi is a phrase used in Jewish popular culture to describe situations where Ashkenazi Judaism overrules or informs all Judaism, right? So it's not about, the, it's not the fact that um, Ashkenazi Judaism, or I would actually say Judaisms because it's also not a monolithic whole at all. Um, it's not that the, the, the problem lies in um, creating spaces for discussions of those experiences, but that it can overrule other experiences or inform all of Judaism. And this is really what I want to get to here. I want to emphasize that um, this phenomenon that we're talking about, you know, sometimes I talk about it and I've had folks come to me and say, well, so are you saying that we need to um, stop talking about um, this important part of the of the of the Jewish world, the Ashkenazi part of the world, of the Jewish world, and I say no, not at all. First of all, as I said before, that in and of itself we cannot flatten into into one experience. The beautiful and complex and and eclectic experiences of Ashkenazi communities and cultures um, is very rich. But what I would also say is that there is the the pie needs to be kind of. Um, expanded or there are enough pieces in the pie to uh, really appreciate the, the true diversity of the Jewish experience. And so when we're only looking at parts of the pie and not others and not making room for others, that's when we are, are, are hurting ourselves. So Ashkenazi normativity is, is not, uh, the, the, the solution to it I would say is not then silencing these important stories as well, but it's about recognizing again, what assumptions do we make in the American Jewish context when we talk about Jews? Are we talking about Larry David and Curb Your Enthusiasm and um, Fiddler on the Roof? Are we talking about Kugel? These are important parts of the story as well, but this is not something that has really any resonance to, for example, my Jewish experience. There's a few other quotes here that um, I, will, um, let's see, I think I'll, um, I, 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 won't, I won't go through them, but uh, these quotes, again, if you uh, want to kind of uh, look through them are uh, from more scholars, actually all the quotes here are from different scholars that again, talk about the, um, the lack of representation either in academia, right? This is what Aviva Ben-Ur is talking about, the overwhelming majority of scholarly works uh, toward American Jewish past and present communicate unawareness of non-Ashkenazi communities. Um, or they talk about um, the educational system. So for example, in Source 7, this was an interview with uh, Michal Biton, who is a community leader and a scholar um, um, of, <coughs> pardon me, of, of Syrian origin, of Argentine Syrian origin here in New York, uh, they were asking her, how can the broader North American Jewish community be more sensitive to diversity? And Michal Biton was talking about being careful with language. And 
um, all who, not all who are religious belong to a Jewish denomination, um, and um, that she hopes that American Jewish organizations apply the language and values of diversity to include the experiences of American Sephardim. And, um, you know, be mindful about that in syllabi, in the way that, it, pedagogically as well. So there are many ways in which Ashkenazi normativity shows up. And now I want to take a moment to um, just pause for a second and speak on the terms Sephardi and Mizrahi, Sephardic and Mizrahi, which are terms that I have been, <coughs> pardon me, um, sharing, um, but not having really defined yet. Um, and I don't want to take that for granted as well, that everybody uh, knows these terms. And I could do a whole session about the history of these terms and the ways that they have been used in different contexts, in different geographic spaces, and in different times. Um, ultimately, as any identity terms, these are socially constructed and they are fluid and they have meant different things to different people at different times. And that doesn't make them any less real or any less salient or important, but the definitions for them have changed for the communities <clears throat> that use them. And that's the first thing I wanted to say. I want to say. So what I'm, what I'm about to offer here is just one way of looking at it, um, but there are multiple ways, and even I, when, when talking about Sephardic and Mizrahi identity, when I have more time, I like to talk about uh, the complexity of these terms. But for our purposes here, when we're talking about Sephardic and Mizrahi Jews, and particularly combining those two um, identities, we're talking about the Jews of, in, we could say, of North Africa, West Asia, Middle East, and Central Asia, often also, often also referred to as the Jews of the Islamic world, Jews who have lived for a majority of their uh, histories in parts of the Islamic world, and also including actually the Balkans, which is uh, eastern parts of Europe that were under the Ottoman Empire. Um, Sephardi comes, you know, from the uh, word Sephardad, which in its most narrow definition um, is referring to the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal, and the Jews who had lived there for centuries and um, actually over a thousand years, um, experienced a cultural flourishing uh, under Islamic rule, and then were ultimately, uh, the majority of them, um, uh, expelled uh, to other parts of the Islamic world um, during the, the, the Catholic reconquering of the region. And as we said, saw in the slides, some of them went to Western Europe, but the majority went into parts of North Africa and West Asia. But who were the Jews that were living there all along? So this is where the term Mizrahi has come uh, uh, emerged. It is a modern term and it is a catch-all term that again has its drawbacks as well because it unites communities from um, Marrakesh to Sana'a, Yemen, uh, to Kurdistan. But um, that term has gained traction among Jews from this region because in a way it kind of has broken up this Sephardic Ashkenazi binary and talks about another big pillar, which are the Jews who never went to Sephardad, to the region of Sephardad or to the region of Ashkenaz, but were always living um, in different parts of North Africa and West Asia. And nowadays we often combine them and we say Sephardic Mizrahi because uh, because due to this history of Sephardic Jews joining their co-religionists in North Africa and the Middle East, um, there, there was a lot of um, intermingling and, and connecting. Even actually, um, if you are more, um, uh, more nuanced in history, even before 1492, there was cultural in, and intellectual interaction. And so there is a, a compelling argument for uh, using both terms together, even though some people might just identify with Sephardi and or and some with Mizrahi. Uh, I, for example, identify with both. Just want to be mindful of our time. Okay, so now moving on, all of these are different pieces, by the way, that I'm setting up uh, to then zoom in on uh, the story, the, the intersectional story of Mizrahi, Sephardi, and LGBTQ+. And in adding more pieces to that story, I'd like to share a little bit about my own journey. 
So this is me <laughs> um, in, uh, this is 19, 1990. So I was three years old here, clearly very, very happy. Um, so I was born in Uzbekistan in 1987 um, when it was still the, uh, the Soviet Union. So technically I was born in a country that no longer exists because the country was USSR. Um, by the time that my family and I left as refugees seeking asylum in 93, Uzbekistan was an independent country. It was two years old, a new country. And, and so I was kind of born in this uh, liminal time between kind of the end of this big, um, I would say experiment really, uh, uh, which was the Soviet Union and then, um, the beginning of these kind of emerging new nation states. Uh, I like to show this photo uh, because I feel like every good Soviet child has this like orange tinted, <laughs> very sad photo that we took. Cause we didn't really, most of us didn't have, you know, uh, cameras at home. So we have, I have just like a handful of child photos, um, uh, photos like from my like early childhood. And this is one of them in a studio, uh, clearly very, very happy. Um, but um, I begin with this because my story as um, as a Jew from Uzbekistan is is an important part of um, of who, of what makes me me both in the Jewish context and 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 more broadly. Um, I am part of the Bukharian Jewish community that I spoke about um, uh, that we mentioned in the slide beforehand. So I'm part of a community, a Persian speaking Jewish community that has lived in Central Asia. Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan for uh, several thousand years. Um, according to our narrative, our story begins with the Babylonian exile to, um, uh, to Babylon and to then Greater Persia and then to, uh, to Central Asia. And so um, I'm part of what these deeply rooted Mizrahi communities who have lived in different parts of the Islamic world um, that are often lesser known, if not known at all. In New York, it's a little bit different because there's a big Bukharian Jewish community here, but many other places where I have spoken about uh, Bukharian Jewish history, there's often a real shock that there are, well, first of all, many folks might not know that Uzbekistan is a country. And if they do, um, they might not know that there is a, a very old uh, and, and a vibrant Jewish community that had existed there for millennia. I'm gonna ask again right now, can everybody hear me? Wonderful. Now, I know I was saying that I'd be asking questions, but I, uh, I want to get through a, a, a bit more. So apologies if I'm not taking questions or comments or feedback or pushback, because uh, I am saying a lot and I know that it can resonate with people in different ways. So I want I want to really I want to be mindful. I want to uh, acknowledge that that apologies for not asking questions yet. And also acknowledge that when we're talking about issues like identity, when we're talking about issues like the marginalization of certain narratives, um, these are, you know, these can get to our, they're very, it can be very touchy and I, and I'm, I'm aware of that. So I hope we are, uh, we can continue learning all of this with, um, with an open heart because that's how I, uh, I want to be presenting it. Um, when talking about my past, I like to honor uh, my family. So this photo is actually my family in 1905 in Tashkent. Uh, so over a century, uh, um, this is over a hundred years old, this photo. I'm very blessed that my grandfather has this photo that he's kept in really great condition. Um, and these are the shoulders of the giants on whom I stand, right? So I can, I, 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 have to, I have to and love to honor them whenever I speak about my story and my experiences because um, I am them and they are me. Uh, the woman to the left here is my great grandmother, Shoshana. Um, and I can do a whole session about close reading. Um, this uh, uh, this photo, but uh, but for now I'll just show it and move for and move on. Uh, this is just you know a a map of Central Asia for those folks who might not know exactly uh, what, what we're talking about. Um, I've had people ask me where Central Asia, and then I would tell them, okay, you know East Asia, China, Mongolia, Korea, yes, you know the Middle East, Arab world, Iran, yes, South Asia, Pakistan, India, Russia above, and I ask them, what do you think is in the middle? And I've had people say an ocean. <laughs> so no, in the middle, we have a large chunk of land called Central Asia. That's a lot of different ethnic groups and it's very diverse. And included in them 
is this ancient uh, uh, Persian speaking and then later also Russian speaking Jewish community called Bukharian Jews. So my story then continues. Uh, there's a lot to say about uh, us immigrating here to, to the States, first to New York. I ultimately, um, uh, we ultimately moved to Seattle, which was not a very common thing for, uh, for my community. Most of my community is still here in Forest Hills and Regal Park, Queens. Uh, but now there's actually a relatively sizable um, uh, Bukharian Jewish community or communities in, in Seattle. Not when we moved in 95, but that's where I grew up. Um, I grew up in a very vibrant Jewish community in South Seattle, in Seward Park, that actually had a very vibrant Sephardic, Ottoman Sephardic community, Ladino-speaking Sephardic community, coming from Rhodes and coming from different cities in modern-day uh, Turkey. And I, you know, the story sounds so... Uh, we, we, you know, we often hear this uh, a lot, and, and when I say this, I, I, it's, I don't want to kind of perpetuate almost the stereotype, but, but it, it holds true. I felt very different from a very young age. It's the only way I can, I can describe it. Um, and for the longest time, I didn't have the language uh, to you, uh, I didn't have the language to express really what was, what was happening. Um, but I knew that that difference didn't just come from me being a Bukharian in a, in a Jewish context where there weren't many people from, from my tradition. There was something more there. And uh, fast forward many, many years, there's a lot more to the story, but fast forward many years and really not only until I came back to New York, kind of coming full circle about, oh gosh, seven years ago, uh, not only until then did I start honestly talking or uh, uh, reflecting on who am I in all the different facets of who I am and what are parts of my identity that I've kind of been sweeping under the carpet. Um, it took actually a very big family trauma for me to realize that I owe it to myself to live my life as intentionally, honestly, and purposefully as I can um, because um, well, I'm going to say another cliche, uh, you know, um, tomorrow isn't promised. And this family trauma uh, that really showed that to me in clear relief um, allowed me to see that I, I shouldn't put off for tomorrow um, what I can do today for myself. And so I started coming out uh, to some friends um, and ultimately to my family. I'm very, very blessed that when I came out to my immediate family, uh, to my mom, who is the dearest person in my life, um, to my sister, um, I was met with love and with support. This is not always the story uh, among many communities, but I'll just say specifically among my community that is both a beautiful community, but also holds um, um, some members in the community, uh, particularly those in leadership, hold uh, values and norms that um, are hostile to LGBTQ folks, even in their community. But I also bring up the story because it's important to show that it isn't also part of the story. The story isn't that all Central Asian Jews or all Mizrahi Jews are homophobic and un not, not accepting. There are stories of trauma and then there are stories of beautiful um, love and understanding. And that was part of my story. Another part of my story is that um, my uncle, um, we really don't talk. And, uh, and that was very painful. And this was somebody who I was very, very close to and who just does not feel comfortable around me. And also another painful part of the story is that my grandparents who are in their 90s um, do not know that I am gay. And that is something that um, I live with. But I, 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 I bring all of that very hopeful, you know, um, earnestly, hopefully, uh, even as an LGBT leader to show that the story is complicated. And particularly uh, when we take into account the cultures and communities that we come from, um, this is not all or nothing here. And for many of us that are trying to hold different parts of our identities, um, it is complicated. As I started coming out, and now, oof, I have um, only 10 minutes left here, but as I started coming out, I, uh, in New York, I was uh, really um, excited and taken aback by the opportunities here for LGBTQ Jewish life. And they were 
uh, plenty. And it was beautiful. And I will always be thankful for those opportunities. But I quickly started asking myself two questions from, uh, that, that uh, emerged from my experiences. And the questions were, where do we as Sephardic and Mizrahi queer Jews fully belong? Are there any spaces in which we can bring our full selves and all of the different layers of our identities? The reason why I was asking these questions is because in my experiences, I found myself always checking something at the door. I found myself never fully coming as my full self. Now, I'm not saying that, uh, you know, somebody was explicitly saying, okay, you are Bukhari and you're, you don't belong here. I've experienced uh, some of that stuff as well. But some of this can be very, it could be subtle, but we know when we feel comfortable or not. And we adapt very well. And I adapted and I was kind of impressed with myself as how I, how I adapted in different spaces. But that gets, that gets exhausting. It gets exhausting when in my, in uh, Bukharian spaces and other Sephardic spaces, um, I was not feeling comfortable being an, as an out gay man. I was not feeling comfortable bringing my partner to different gatherings, even though I deeply connect to the culture that I come from. And it was also exhausting um, that in LGBT, in many LGBTQ spaces, I was not seeing many people who look like me, who come from my background. I was not seeing leadership that represented um, Sephardic and Mizrahi voices or content, events that represented um, our experiences. And so ultimately I realized these spaces, a space where all of these different parts of our identities can fully come together, that space didn't really exist. Even in the, the beautiful LGBTQ hub of New York City. And so I, along with um, several other community members, decided to do something about it. I wanted to uh, just uh, present this quote. This is from one of our community members and leaders um, uh, who gave me his name with permission, who, uh, basic, who said it really aptly, I think, we're a minority within the minority within the minority. And um, uh, this is a community member of ours who is uh, half Iraqi, half Yemenite, um, and, uh, and Israeli. Um, and then there's another article I encourage you to read about Ashkenormativity being twice as common and harmful in LGBTQ Jewish spaces. So these systems show up even in spaces that perhaps we hope um, have, uh, are more sensitive to values of inclusivity. And I'm not, by the way, here to, to speak pejoratively about them. I think things develop and evolve with time and we need, and with time we just have more awareness and more sensitivity. And with that, we're able to offer, uh, to, to, to offer more opportunities that really represent the diversity of the Jewish people. That's really what it's all about. So for me, it's not coming from a place of frustration or anger, even though for some members of the community that we built, it was, it really came from a place of, of hurt. Um, for me, it's coming from a place of, there's an opportunity here. There's a niche and we can address that. And so from that, we built the Sephardic Mizrahi Q Network. <clears throat> which is um, now over three years old, a grassroots organization um, that uh, seeks to create a vibrant, supportive, dynamic space for uh, LGBTQ, Jews, LGBTQ Jews at the intersection of LGBTQ plus identity and Sephardic and Mizrahi identity. Uh, this is a little bit about us, um, including our, our mission, which I uh, basically mentioned uh, here, um, just to read the second part of it, um, because it connects to what we were what, what I've been talking about. So SMQN seeks to create a much needed communal platform for the intersection of LGBTQ and Sephardic Mizrahi life, a platform where queer Jews of Mizrahi and Sephardic backgrounds can unapologetically bring their full selves and celebrate their multi-layered identities. And hopefully by doing this work, we envision a world in which the intersectional experiences of LGBTQ Sephardic and Mizrahi Jews are better understood and welcomed by Jewish LGBTQ organizations in general, 
as well as Sephardic religious and cultural institutions. So it's sort of like the main mission right now for us is to really build and strengthen this community from within because the folks in our community, the majority of them up until joining our community have not had that kind of space. And I hear that time and time again from members in our community coming from the Syrian uh, 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 community in Brooklyn or the Persian community in Great Neck or the Bukharian community in Queens or uh, Morocco and Yemeni and so on and so forth. This is something really, um, a common thread, a common reaction would be, I so needed this. And so a lot of our work really right now focuses on creating that space within. While at the same time, by the way, our community is not just exclusive. We also have LGBTQ Ashkenazim and LGBTQ uh, Jews of color who might not necessarily identify as Mizrahi and non-Jewish LGBTQ folks who come who are also excited about this mission and who are also excited about creating platforms where stories that have been too often on the margins are now at the forefront. Um, but ultimately, it's about actually affecting the Jewish community at large and building the bridges to broader LGBTQ organizations and broader Sephardic institutions. Okay, I am uh, running out of time quickly. Um, a, a few things to say um, about our approach. So we are very much, and we talk about this, we are very much a grassroots organization that um, empowers individuals in our community to take ownership of their Jewish experiences and their Jewish journeys. And so all of our programs, for example, one program is our monthly Shabbat gatherings, which have up until recently been uh, physical gatherings. Uh, they happen pop-up style in different homes around the city. This allows us to to grow a, like again, this very grassroots community in an intimate, organic way. And by having the Shabbat programming in different people's homes, it gives different community members um, the opportunity to really take ownership of the, of the Jewish experience and of the Shabbat experience, which for many of us Sephardic and Mizrahi Jews really meant everything. But for many of us, we were then ultimately kind of robbed of that experience as we started coming out. And so gathering around the Shabbat dinner table is a very important and intentional and strategic way in which we build this community and gathering specifically around the Shabbat table in different people's homes. Everybody can still hear me? Great, it's a little glitchy on my end, so I wanted to make sure. Um, there's a lot to also say about the partnerships we've developed. And I would be remiss if I didn't at least mention it a little bit because the work that we've done is important. It's work that hasn't really been done before, but it has been with the support of legacy organizations, more established organizations, uh, and organizations that do have more traditionally um, Ashkenazi leadership, but are continuing to move forward in ensuring that their leadership represents the diversity of the, of the Jewish world. And so partnerships that we've had with One Table, with Moshe House, with uh, uh, JCC Harlem, a very, very important partnership that we have developed with them this past year that I can talk about as its own thing um, via the UJA Federation of New York. These partnerships have allowed us to grow in the way that we need to and has also inform, allowed us to inform and share wisdom and best practices of inclusivity with these organizations. And so it's been very symbiotic. The last organization I wanted to mention here in terms of partnership is the American Sephardic Federation. Um, it's been really incredible. This is again, part of our bigger vision to have established uh, really um, uh, strong bridges with this cultural scholarly communal Sephardic organization um, housed in, um, Union Square area, it's, it's part of the Center for Jewish History. And to be visible as an LGBT Sephardic group in ASF events is something that um, is, is, is really uh, moving the needle forward. A few visuals <laughs> of our events. Um, our, um, you know, it's also tricky to find photos that we can use because the majority of our community members are not comfortable with having their photos public. They're not fully out. Our, group, our Facebook group of over 700 Sephardic and Mizrahi Jews from around the world is private. You cannot find it. You have to be added. So again, it's this really like word of mouth, grassroots uh, modality that also uh, needs to be there because of the sensitivity 
of um, of uh, the community that, 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 that we create space for. This was us marching at Jew York Pride with other LGBT Jewish organizations two years ago. And so again, our story fits into the broader story of the LGBT Jewish experience and the Jewish experience uh, more broadly. Another photo. I'm not going to get to this, but I wanted to just also uh, honor the fact that um, conversations in Sephardic and Mizrahi communities about um, same-sex love, uh, maybe the terms LGBTQ weren't used, but about um, uh, the experiences of, 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 of people who have... Uh, uh, who experience same-sex love or about gender diversity, these topics are nothing new. And sometimes people forget that, again, in maybe a more narrow mindset of what Sephardic mentalities have been like. So this is a poem uh, <clears throat> from the Iberian Peninsula over a thousand years ago, uh, uh, a very homoerotic poem. And then to the right is another homoerotic poem by Emma Lazarus, who many of us know from New Colossus, uh, uh, wrote uh, uh, the poem that's on the pedestal of the Statue of Liberty. And so it's important to remember that this is a conversation that's been ongoing. Um, and what I would like to end with, <laughs> and I'm very sorry, I actually didn't get to uh, questions, but uh, thank you for being here with me. I just wanted to end with um, some of our outcomes. So right now we have our group is, our, our community is over 700 people strong. Uh, we've been featured in a few um, uh, magazines. Uh, our work has been featured. But for me, what's really most important are the testimonials that come from our community members. And so I just wanted to read the, 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 la, uh, the one down here. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a great one up here that was featured in an Alma uh, article written by one of our Bukharian Jewish uh, uh, lesbian members. But I want to read this one. As a first generation Iranian Jewish lesbian community has always been a vital element in my life. However, usually separated. The SMQN LGBTQ Shabbat dinners build a community where, with others, I'm now able to weave all facets of my identity together. And, um, and so the final thing that I want to say is that, again, the story that I've told you today is, is a particular story, but really it fits into what I call the Jewish mosaic. It fits into the beautiful, complex story of our collect collective of our Jewish peoplehood experience. And the more that we create platforms for stories like this and other stories that are on the margins, the more we actually all benefit from it. Thank you so much. Hag Sameach, Moadim Simcha, and uh, enjoy the rest of the evening and good night and sleep tight to those who are going to sleep. <laughs>